Many of you know this guy, Mark Wagner. Uh, Mark grew up at Monta Vista. If you don't know him, Mark grew up at Monta Vista. And from here, he went to NTSU. And uh, sort of from that point, made his way to Nashville. He wanted to get into the music scene because he was a great singer and a part of a band. Ended up going west. This is uh, a few times. A few times. <laughs> Did some ministry with uh, an organization, ministry in Africa. Done that. Ended up going to Fuller Seminary on the West Coast. Has worked with Young Life throughout his ministry, strong here when he was here in Blount County, and then also uh, career wise as well. And uh, maybe one of the last times that we saw him was at his ordination. He was getting ready to be a part of a church staff, and so that church asked if we would ordain him, and we did that. Enthusiastic and glad to, glad to do that. And uh, now he's working on a doctorate, still on the West Coast, but kind of changed some places around. Uh, and he's getting ready to be the senior pastor at a Methodist church on July 1st. <laughs> and uh, whenever he was telling me that whenever he, he had his uh, dedica baby dedication here, parent child dedication, that Howard, his middle, his middle name is West, Mark Wesley Wagner. How he made a reference that he was destined to become a Methodist with a middle name like Wesley. I don't think he knew how happy he would be in this foreshadowing. So that has, uh, that was prophecy that has come that has come true. So whenever Mark is he, he was in town, I heard he was in town, so I thought we hardly ever get to hear him sing. So I asked if he would sing for us, and he's not going to. Uh, and, and I said, at least come, you know, so that we can kind of catch up with you a little bit on some of the things that are going on. And, one of the, so I just want to kind of be sure. So we met this week. I changed at the end of the week what I was going to do on a sermon. So we decided to just have a conversation and let you be a part of hearing this conversation. Um, so I'm going to ask you just, we're going to talk a little bit. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the things that you've been learning about God and uh, this whole transformation in your life? What's happening yeah. about what you're learning? Yeah, I'd love to. So I'm. Um, uh, almost finished with a program at Boston University, and it's a doctorate in transformational leadership. And I didn't realize when I started how transformational it would be. Um, but through this process and through this journey, God has revealed so much more of God's self uh, to me. And I started to realize this sounds silly, but God is so much bigger than I ever imagined. Uh, over the last few years, I've started to, to look at Scripture differently, started to read Scripture differently. Uh, as you can imagine, living in on the West Coast, studying in Boston, traveling extensively throughout Africa, growing up in the South, uh, that those are some pretty different perspectives. And as I got to know more and more people and understood how other people in different parts of the world experience God, how other people in different places read scripture, uh, I started to realize I, maybe, maybe I didn't have all the answers. <laughs> Although sometimes I like to think I do. Um, and so really, the last couple years uh, has, has been a journey of discovery. I like to say, to say that it's a journey of discovery. And one of the things, as we talked last week, you asked me, what are some of the things I remember about growing up here? And I remember a lot of the lessons that uh, Dean Denton taught when she was our youth youth minister here. I don't know why I remember them, but certain things uh, stick out. And, and one of the things that she always told us was that this journey of discovering who God is will never end. Uh, we don't land, in other words. This whole life is a journey of discovery and growing and understanding more and more about who God is and and seeing scripture through different lenses as we get older and as different uh, seasons of life. And that has never been more true for me in, until the last probably three years. Um, and, and I think that's probably been the biggest thing is, is just understanding how big God is. Um, and this sounds silly, but I, the first time I said this out loud was probably two years ago. But really learning that God is bigger than the Bible even. Which sounds obvious, right? But when I articulated that out loud and I realized, wow, God is alive right now 
and acting and doing things in the world and in our lives. And um, sometimes for me, growing up, especially spending 12 years in, in theological school, um, it's easy to want to look at the Bible and go, oh, here's where all the answers are. Um, but that's just not true, because God's still alive and working and active in our world. And I think that was probably the foundation of this, of this journey of discovery for me. Now, I know that sometimes it's the events that happen in our lives, but not sometimes, all the events in our lives really shape us in some way. And so, when you, as you talk about God being bigger, learning about bigger, uh, one of the storms that y'all went through had to do with adoption. So how did that, what role did that play in this understanding of God? Yeah, so we are, we're still in, in an adoption process, and I, I'm, it, it's a weird thing. If you've ever uh, adopted a child, it can be a long journey, and our certainly has been. Uh, 2016, summer of 2016 is when I, I, I learned through multiple tests that I, we wouldn't be able to have our own kids. And so, you know, growing up in a, a certain culture, a certain kind of expectation that you'd grow up, get married, have babies, you know, do the whole deal. And I think when I realized, oh, wow, my story is going to be different. Uh, I didn't know anyone at the time that... that wasn't able to have their own kids, and so I all of a sudden started to feel like a little bit of an outcast, um, especially in certain circles. All my friends at that point had had, you know, two or three kids, and, you know, Callie and I kind of were wrestling with this, you know, we, we, may, we may not be able to have our own, and so um, that was the first time, I think, for me that I felt like something <coughs> didn't really go as planned. You know, um, and, and it really made me start to wrestle with, with who God is and, and even with scripture. You know, I would look back at verses in, uh, in Psalms where it talks about how children are, are a reward. Uh, children are a gift. They're a reward um, from God. And I started to ask, huh, why, well, I wonder why I'm not going to get rewarded with kids of my own. And so... Um, that was a tough one. It still is, actually. It's it's a tough one to, to wrestle with. Um, but but what happened on, in that summer when we really found out for sure is we had talked about adoption for years, and so we thought, well, let's start. Let's start the process. So we're three and a half years in. We can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Most days we feel like giving up uh, because it just feels like this thing that's never going to happen. Uh, but we've had a couple... Uh, the opportunities that have fallen through for various reasons, and so it's de it's definitely been a, a roller coaster. But we're still in it, and hoping in the next year or two uh, we'll be bringing children home from Colombia. So we're, that's a question we get asked a lot. We're currently in the Colombia program. So, yeah. you know that as you tell that story, it reminds me that um, you know, we sort of have it in our mind. This is how our lives going to unfold and what's going to happen. God always has something else in mind. Yeah. I think about the story of Abraham. He said, I want you to go to a place you've never been before, and it's a new land, it's a different land. And Abraham did that. He went and trusted, and uh, it was really a walk of faith. This adoption is, I think, just one episode that says, Do I just take me to a land that I didn't think I would go to? Or I didn't plan to go to? Or I didn't want to go to? And um, so you started up a few blogs. To tell you in German, yeah. you've got three entries so far. So when I read the first one, I was kind of blown away. Mm -hmm. And I thought, is God taking you to an Abraham experience, to a place that you've never been before? It's sort of what it sounded like. You made me want to read the second one. You made me want to read the third one. So can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, this new journey? Because this is it's an Abraham. It's yeah. an Abraham journey. Well, when the book comes out, I'm going to ask you to do a, a pitch for me, because that was a pretty good sell. So, um, we have been on, on a, an unexpected journey, and, and our, my very first blog post, I think I mentioned that the journey of discovery with God is often unexpected, and it feels a little bit unfair at times, and, and a lot of you have probably experienced that. And um, this latest chapter for us has felt that way. 
we certainly were not asking for uh, this experience, and it kind of felt like it fell into our laps. But um, several years ago, when I first started my program at Boston U, uh, we had a guest lecturer come in, and his name is David Weekly, Dr. David Weekly, and he's a minister in the Methodist Church. And I, I shared, this is chapter three of my blog, so if you want to read more, you can. Um, and he began to share his story and his journey of, of being a pastor for 30 years, and I was so inspired by him and by his story and his love for the Lord and his, his passion for serving Jesus, and it just blew me away. And I, I, I remember sitting in the classroom thinking, I can't wait to have lunch with this guy after this class. Um, and then he, he continued to share his journey, and he shared that he is transgender. <sighs> And he had undergone a, a process um, earlier in his life. And uh, I remember sitting in the classroom and, you know, there's 20 doctor of ministry students, pastors and ministers. And I started to get really uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, I remember realizing I was literally sweating through my shirt um, as he was sharing this journey with us. And I looked around the room thinking, well, why is no one else freaking? Like he, that he just shared this. This doesn't feel okay that he just shared this at a, at a theological institute. And this is two years ago. And uh, it led me to this crazy, you know, I started having conversations with my classmates. They're all pastoring churches all around the country. And they had different views on this, this issue that is, it can be so divisive, right? That this issue of LGBTQ inclusion in our culture, it can be so divisive. And at the time I was on, I was on my own journey with this, with this issue. As a, as a college pastor, and sure you can imagine, I'm having conversations with college students about these things that are happening in culture every single day. Um, and it's okay for me to not always have the answer, but, but that question kept coming up. And that experience in that classroom really read me, led me to scratch my head and think, okay, I'm, I'm not sure that, I, that this one's solved yet because I just sat in a classroom with 30 other Christian pastors and ministers from all different denominations, all from all around the country that, that view this issue differently than I do. So it kind of led me to go back and re-examine um, what I believed about this and in a healthy way. And then I, what, what I realized was that there are pastors and ministers and professors and theologians and scholars all around the world that are having conversations like this about the issue of LGBTQ inclusion because we're all kind of scratching our heads now and going, hmm, maybe we should take another look. And so uh, basically Callie and I came home from that class. We drove from Utah to Boston amazing we should do it um and the whole drive home we were talking about this pastor his name's david weekly and he had published a book about his journey and and we were just struggling with the fact that he had just shared his story in my doctor of ministry class and uh so we said okay here's what we'll do we said let's pray because that's a good thing right to pray <laughs> And let's ask the Lord to guide this journey for us. If we really believe that God is who God says he is, uh, and that the Holy Spirit is alive and active and working in our lives, then we can trust the Holy Spirit to guide this process. Uh, there's a great story in Acts 5, you can, you can check it out later, but this guy, Gamaliel, who, he's a Pharisee. And when the early church is rising up and they're gaining all these followers, uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, get really worried. And so uh, they say, hey, we got to take these guys down. This is a movement that we need to squash. And Gamaliel stands up as one of the religious leaders and says, don't worry. Because if this movement is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's of God, there's nothing we can do. And so Callie and I kept coming back to that, that idea that, all right, Lord, we want to look at this issue again because we were having countless conversations with college students and, and even colleagues of mine. And I said, it's worth looking at. And I was certainly no expert. So we did and we prayed and we said, Lord, would you please guide this journey so that we might be led to your truth and not this, the truth that we've always believed uh, or always thought 
uh, but that we would be led to your truth. So that, that was the beginning of the journey, and it has since continued. And that's really what the blog is about. I wrote 12 chapters, and I'm releasing them one, one a week. And, and so we're on this week of the chapter four, so. Yeah. I'll wait to, wait to hear. Wait to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know this, this is a big issue. It's a big issue for our culture, for our country, uh, it's, and it's a big issue for, for churches. Uh, I know the Methodist Church, you know, has uh, dealt in their annual conference with, the, with this issue about uh, people who are gay serving in leadership positions. That was a big thing for them this summer. Um, I was in Knoxville yesterday, and there were a lot of uh, pride signs. And we see a lot more on television that's kind of exposing us to, uh, to, to this. And, um, and then recently, I, I think you caught up on the news about the, the Knoxville police officer, who's also a pastor, right. who, made, who made the comment this week that uh, all people who are, I guess, convicted of a crime of LGBTQ ought to be executed. And he did that from the pul from the pulpit, so it's a very mm -hmm. strong picture from, from the Christian community. One of the things I began to think about is as much as this is an issue for an issue, that Jesus didn't really deal with issues. He dealt with people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to talk a little bit about people because we're all going to be divided on an issue. Right. So as this journey has unfolded for you and you have prayed, and I think one of the things that you said that you prayed for was, God help us to meet people who can help us yeah. to understand. Um, so can you tell us from some of those experiences that you have had about people, about their struggles, their struggles with themselves, their struggles with God, the struggle with the church, yeah. to help us to understand people who may be very different than, than us, may not be very different. Yeah. That's a great question. And, and there's an old saying, you've heard it, to walk a mile in another man's shoes um, to kind of get a glimpse of what their life is like and what their experience is like. And I think one of the first things I was struck by when we started to examine this issue was that I had never done that with uh, an LGBTQ person. I had never tried to see things through their lens. And I even started to think, what if that, what if, what if that was me? What if that was my journey? Uh, how would I want people to treat me? How would I expect to be treated by uh, the church? Um, and, and so what happened was, what you're referring to, uh, I had a colleague at BU at Boston University who said, you know, if you're going to embark on this journey, you need to pray and ask the Lord to bring some people into your life so that you can hear their stories and begin to understand their perspective. Which is really true, right? A lot of us have been through... Uh, journeys of transformation, and when we build relationships with people that are different than us, we start to realize uh, maybe maybe our lens need to, lenses need to shift a little uh, to, so that we can hold their stories as well as our stories. So we did. We prayed. Said, Lord, if this is from you, if this is a journey you're calling us to, uh, would you bring some people into our lives? And I kid you not, within two months, we had met six people from the LGBTQ community that. Uh, we became fast friends with. And we weren't looking for them. Uh, it just happened. And they started sharing their stories with us in their journeys. And we were struggling uh, to reconcile these new relationships. Um, one uh, person in particular, one, one individual came into my office. At the, at the time we were living in Washington, Callie and I were both college pastors at a large evangelical church. And we had a congregation of about 400 college students. And one of the students came into my office and she sat down and she said, uh, I'm really scared and I need to meet with you and Callie. So we said, yeah, that's, that's why we're here, let's chat. And she shared that she had was thinking about harming herself and that she had tried twice before to do that and had been unsuccessful. And she needed to tell someone because she was afraid. And so at, 
if you've ever been kind of trained in that kind of conversation, the next question is, uh, so, so you want to harm yourself, do you have a plan? And she shared her plan in detail. And they don't really teach you how to deal with this stuff in seminary, so I was freaking out a little bit at the time. Um, but in, in her process of sharing, she shared that she was gay. And that's the reason she wanted to end her life. Because she had been told by her parents and her community that she didn't belong. And that, that God had made a mistake on her. And she didn't want to be that way. Desperately. Enough so that she decided that she didn't want to be in this world anymore. And so we sat in my office for about four hours that night with Callie and myself and this young lady and just cried and prayed and um, we left and she, uh, we continued to meet with her regularly. And that's, that was the kind of the common piece that I kept hearing from these new friends was we, we don't want this. I don't want this. I want to be a part of the church. I want to lead. Uh, one, one young man that I met with uh, for coffee multiple times felt called into ministry. He said, I grew up in the church. Uh, I've been very involved with Young Life. And, and now I feel like God's calling me to go to seminary. And he wants me to be a pastor. And so I couldn't wait to meet with him, obviously, to hear his story and, and to share all of my wisdom. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, and he shared in the midst of that conversation that he felt like his dream would never become a reality because he's gay. He said, I don't know any church that would ever let me be a part of their community or, or lead this community. And I didn't know what to say. You know, in all of these conversations, all those, those the Bible verses that I'd heard, and, and you know, the two or three Bible verses that I had been quoted and quoted to other people, all of a sudden they didn't really feel like they held up when I was hearing real people's stories and real people's struggles. Um, so that really started to change everything for us, and it, and it led to a lot of controversy in our jobs and in our church. Um, but... It also, what it really led to was uh, a re-examination for me of those scriptures. Because what I couldn't personally reconcile was, but what about the Bible? The Bible says this. this does, it, didn't, it didn't seem to go together in my mind that, that real people would be struggling this much. Uh, and that, that this is what the Bible seemed to say. And one thing that I did learn in seminary was how to study the Bible. Uh, and so I went back to the scriptures and I started doing just intense uh, historical critical analysis of those scriptures and, and those passages throughout scripture. And I started to realize that there are, there are, there are other perspectives on the biblical interpretation. And so... Um, this has obviously been a long journey. We're in the middle of this journey. But what I kept coming back to was, was the, the life and ministry of Jesus. I kept coming back to the life and ministry of Jesus. Because Jesus' ministry was radically inclusive. And that's what I couldn't reconcile. I couldn't reconcile excluding these young college students that felt called to serve the Lord. In, in light of Jesus' ministry of radical inclusion. So, which got me into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the church that we served at uh, prior to, to where we're going now had a very clear policy uh, and that all LGBTQ individuals should be excluded uh, basically from anything but attending. And they would call themselves welcoming. That this is what they would say. That they would say, we're welcoming but not affirming. Which is a common phrase I hear all the time. As you can imagine, I've been engaging in lots of these conversations over the last two years. And uh, so I, I inquired about that. And I met with our senior pastor and our executive pastor. And I said, can you explain this to me, exactly what it means 
because I am the college pastor and I have quite a few LGBTQ students in my congregation that I'm building relationships with and walking alongside and helping disciple them so that they can grow in their faith. So can you explain to me what our church's policy is? And my executive pastor said, you know, I'm not really an expert on this issue, but I know that we can't baptize them and that they won't be able to serve in any official capacity in the church. And I thought, I was a month on the job, by the way. <laughs> and I thought, um, I'm not sure I'll be able to enforce that. I said, uh, and, and, and what it also caused me to do was to step back and go, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on this issue either, but if none of us are experts on this issue, then should we be excluding someone from the rite of baptism? Or if, if I'm not an expert on this issue, should I be telling an individual that when they hear God's voice and, and God says, I'm calling you to serve in the church, no, you're wrong. God's not calling you to do that. At least we should be experts on the issue before we do that, I thought. And so that led me to further study and further prayer and diving deeper into this journey. And about six months after that, you know, we, we weren't really faced with the situation at the time. But one of our, our students came to me and she asked to serve on Tuesday nights at our college service. She wanted to be a greeter and, and to take up the offering. And I said, yes, absolutely. Uh, I had been walking, we had been walking with her and she was growing in her faith and she wanted to take the next step and serve in the ministry. And we said yes. And we found out pretty quickly that that was against the policy of our church. And so we were asked to make a choice. Uh, we could either resign or we could prohibit this young lady from serving in our, in our ministry. And so we resigned from our positions as college pastor, which caused quite a stir, as you can imagine. Um, but at that point, I was about two years into this journey and utterly convinced that God is big enough to hold all of us. And that my lens of interpretation through which I had been reading and studying and understanding the scripture uh, was growing and transforming. Um, and so we left our jobs, had no idea what, what we were doing. I was about to finish a doctorate of ministry and felt like uh, I was a total failure because there were, I had no leads. And I thought, what church will hire me after finding out about this? Um, and about three weeks later, the Ellensburg First United Methodist Church uh, in, in town called and said we'd like to talk to you about stepping in as our, as our next senior pastor and so We start in two weeks <laughs> Which I've never been a senior pastor before so I'll keep you on the speed dial <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's certainly been a journey and God I, I promise you every day for 18 months We have prayed Lord if we are off base Please bring us back Please correct our trajectory. And we've continued to move more and more in this, in this new direction. And so God has been amazing. I, I, my view of God, as I mentioned at the beginning, has grown. Um, and my view of, of Scripture and the mystery of God and the mystery of Scripture is, is so much more robust and beautiful uh, than it ever has been. Uh, I know you're a Christian preacher before. And... He tells a story in, at the beginning of one of his books about a woman in London who was on the underground and on the train. And she had this revelation. It's like God opens her eyes to be able to see Christ in everybody who is in this subway car. Um, that, that there are people who are rejoicing, and she said, I, I, could, I could see Christ in them. I'm very busy. There were people who were struggling and suffering, and I could see Christ in them. There were people who... Who, who had no regard for Jesus at all in their life, that he was dead, and, and it was almost like they were a tomb for him, but that he was present in everybody, in some form or fashion, working, 
for transformation and redemption and, and working for life. Um, so, you know, you've made us uncomfortable this morning, which is not always a bad thing. You've also uh, helped us to see, I think, on a level that God, that Christ is in all people. And it is about it is about people and where they are and what God is doing. You've also, I think, encouraged us or encouraged me to think about what happens when God begins to work in your life and takes you someplace that you've never been before and you didn't ask to go. So you grew up here at Marcus. And uh, was there anything in your experiences in those 18 years that you were here that you have carried with you? This journey, these journeys, whatever journey it might be, that um, you just carried with you, that have, that have helped you or made a difference or at least had an impact or played a role? Yeah. You know, I, lots of things come to mind. I, I think specifically about the lessons that I was taught and, and experienced in my time as a youth group here. Um, Monta Vista has always been a unique church in this county, and uh, I would say one of the more progressive voices in this community, in, specifically in regards to how do we care for those people that are often forgotten. Um, and I think specifically about the, the homeless shelter. I uh, think about when I was about 10 years old and I watched uh, uh, Lisa get ordained here as a woman in ministry and leadership and how at the time I didn't know how controversial that was. Uh, I just knew that she was incredibly gifted and called by the Lord to lead in the church. So I thought, well, of course we're going to affirm that. Of course we're going to affirm God's calling in her life. And so I, I think what that did was it built a foundation for me to um, experience and explore uh, God's diversity and, and, and God's um, beauty. And, and also just to continue to ask those big questions. I would say that Monte Vista is countercultural, not not in the broad cultural term, but in church culture almost. And that when I left here feeling like I could ask questions, I could wrestle with scripture. Uh, I think that's what led me to the West Coast to study theology, and then to Boston University, probably the most progressive theological institute in the U.S. for sure. Uh, I have this foundation that was built here that. People were following Jesus above all. One of my favorite verses now is John 5, uh, 39. And Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, uh, You search the scriptures, because in them you think you might find eternal life. But the scriptures, the purpose of the scriptures is to point to me. Why don't you just come to me? And I think as I reflect on my journey at Monta Vista, I'm grateful because, you know, when I travel now around the world and tell people that I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, they get these pictures in their head of what that's like. That's not what it was like for me. Uh, I grew up in a church that valued the authority of Scripture and valued the person of Jesus Christ. How does Jesus Christ love and serve others? What does Jesus teach? Let's look at scripture through that lens of who Jesus is and how Jesus loves others. And so when I think about that verse now, that has come to, to my mind more often now than ever. I think that truly was instilled at me here. And I, I, again, I mentioned the Dean Denton's conversation about the Holy Spirit. Uh, she taught us that the Holy Spirit is alive and active right now, right now among us. God is bigger. Uh, people say, how do you get here? I say, God is bigger. God is bigger than the Bible. God is bigger than tradition. Uh, God is so much bigger and more beautiful. So I don't know that I would be in that place had it not been for what I was taught and how I was raised in this church uh, to believe that God is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. So, so, we are glad that you are not going to say a product of 
Monte Vista, but we are glad that you passed through Monte Vista and that you keep circling back for events. And, uh, and thank you for sh sharing very openly and honestly about something that's really hard. This, um, as I said, this is a tough issue that uh, tough. Yeah. And you're right. We don't, know, we don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. But I appreciate your willingness to share with us a couple of things that I think are going to be some takeaways. And that is, are we open to how the God, how the Spirit of God is leading and guiding us? And will we, do the, will we go and question and consider and think about whatever it is that God may be laying on our heart, whatever that might be. Are, are we willing to say yes to him? And are we willing to pay the price if you really pay the price? A, a, a tough, a tough um, And do we, are we, do we continue to remember that people are why Jesus came? And people are why Jesus died. And people are who Jesus loved and included. Not issues. So, by, I think by helping us to see another side of a new of story, people who are struggling, I want to love God, I want to be involved in the church, yeah. I want to find a place, <laughs> but sometimes are not the doors are closed. Yeah. Yeah. So, you've given us some things to think about. How do we do that? How do we follow the one who is the most loving and inclusive person in the world yeah. and, and be loving? Thanks for listening. That's all right. So thank you all for listening. And thank you for, uh, for being here and allowing us to do this today. Um, you know, we're not on an agenda. We're just sharing one person, one family's story, because Callie is in this story too. And uh, hope that your story will be enlightened by it. And as I said, we'll walk away with just the idea that I will work. Where is God leading me? And how is he transforming me? Because yeah. if he's not, something's wrong. <laughs> you know, he ought to be transforming all of us in, yeah. in some way, form, or fashion, peeling off those layers that need to be changed, whatever they may be. Yeah. Not about this, but about anything. So, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Glad to be here. Thank you. Next time, we'll do the same. All right. Great. Great. Great.